In this part, we will explore how the corpuscular theory of light and the wave theory of light would each have their own champions and compete for ultimate success. We will discuss the contributions made by the likes of Bernoulli, Young and Fresnel. In 1728, James Bradley attempted to determine the parallax of a star in the head of the dragon. What he discovered was that during the winter the transit across the meridian was actually more southerly, while during the following summer its original position was restored by a motion northwards. This effect could not be explained by parallax, but instead was caused by the gradual propagation of light. This discovery would therefore allow astronomers to calculate the ratio of the mean orbital velocity of the Earth to the velocity of light, or as it was called at the time, the constant of aberration. From this Bradley was able to calculate that light took 8 minutes and 12 seconds to propagate from the Sun to the Earth. With the exception of Bradley's discovery, the 18th century was decidedly barren in both experimental and theoretical investigations of light which is in stark contrast to the brilliance of the discoveries in electricity. It is worth pausing to consider an ether concept put forward by the young John Bernoulli. His ideas seem to be built on top of the ideas his father, also named John Bernoulli, had put forward in 1701, which connected the laws of refraction with the mechanical principle of the composition of forces. If two opposing forces whose ratio is mu maintained in equilibrium a particle which is free to move only in a given plane, it follows from the triangle of forces that the direction of forces must obey the relationship sin i equals mu sin r. This is the same equation as that which expresses the law of refraction, and the elder Bernoulli conjectured that a theory of light might be based on this but was never able to give any satisfactory explanation for the existence of the forces. This would be done by his son. His concept was that all space was permeated by a fluid ether, containing an immense number of excessively small whirlpools. The elasticity of the ether allows it to transmit vibrations largely because of these whirlpools. This, he reasoned, was due to the centrifugal force each one possessed causing it to press upon the neighbouring ones. Throughout this medium there are small solid particles who are much smaller than the distance they are apart. They are pushed about by the whirlpools whenever the ether is disturbed but never travel far from their original starting point. A source of light communicates to its surroundings a disturbance that condenses the nearest whirlpools which then displaces the particles from their equilibrium position. This in turn causes the condensation of the next whirlpools. This way the vibrations are propagated in every direction from the luminous point. What is curious is that Bernoulli defined these vibrations as longitudinal, but at the time Newton had already shown that the polarization of light ruled out any longitudinal vibrations. What is impressive is that Bernoulli's ether, aside from the longitudinal vibrations, resembles the one Maxwell would come up with in 1861, for the express purpose of securing a transverse vibration. He so narrowly missed out on one of the greatest discoveries. Not long after this, the controversy of refraction that pitted Descartes against Fermat would be reawakened by Pierre-Louis Moreau de Maupertuis. The main arguments between these two was regarding the speed of light. Descartes thought it would be greatest in a dense medium, whereas Fermat thought that the light would travel at its fastest in free ether. Maupertuis thought that Descartes was right, but wished to retain Fermat's beautiful method, so he proposed that instead of assuming light follows the quickest path, he felt that it should be that it follows the path described by which the quantity of action is the least. So instead of Fermat's expression here, where T denotes time and V velocity, and ds is an element of the path, Maupertuis defined it as follows. What is important to realize is that in this case V represents the velocity according to the corpuscular theory which is proportional to the reciprocal of Fermat's V, which denotes the velocity according to the wave theory. This means the two expressions are really equivalent. The important point of his work is more about the dynamics. His suggestions were subsequently developed further by himself and Euler and Lagrange into a general principle that covers the whole range in nature. 
most of the natural philosophers of the 18th century for the most part accepted the corpuscular hypothesis. There were some who would defend the wave theory, and these would include the likes of Benjamin Franklin and Euler. Both saw a problem with the idea that the emission of particles would cause a decrease in the mass of the radiating body, which had not been observed. In contrast, the wave theory had no such consequence. In a series of letters Euler wrote, he set forth his view on natural philosophy. He anticipated Maxwell in asserting that the source of all electrical phenomena is the same ether that propagates light. Electricity, in his view, was nothing but a dearrangement of the equilibrium of the ether. A body must become electrical, he said, whenever the ether contained in its pores becomes more or less elastic than that which is lodged in the adjacent bodies. This happens when a greater quantity of ether is introduced into the pores of the body or when the ether contained within it is forced out. The effort it makes to recover the equilibrium with the surroundings produces all the phenomena of electricity. In his view, a single ether would account for all the phenomena, including gravity. The fortunes of the wave theory started to brighten by the end of the century, when a new champion arose. Thomas Young began writing his optical theory in 1799. He outlined a superior theory to explain reflection and refraction. In particular, it was able to explain why light would be partially reflected on certain objects and was analogous to the partial reflection of sound from a cloud or denser stratum of air. The refracting medium would contain a denser quantity of luminous ether compared to a vacuum, but would not affect its elasticity. Young's greatest discovery would come in 1801 when he was attempting to explain Newton's rings using the principle of wave theory. The concept he used had originally been put forward by Newton in his theory of tides. He had stated that the tide may propagate from the oceans through different channels towards the same port and may pass in less time through some channels than others. The effect by the composition of these would generate new types of tides. Young used the analogy of a lake to make his point. Suppose a number of equal waves of water move upon the surface of a stagnant lake with a certain constant velocity and enter a narrow channel leading out of the lake. Now suppose another similar series of waves are excited in the lake which arrive at the same channel with the same velocity and at exactly the same time as the first. Neither series of waves will destroy each other but their effects will combine. Where wave peaks meet, they will combine, and where a trough meets a peak, they will create a smooth surface. His view is that a similar effect takes place whenever two portions of light are mixed. This he called the general law of interference of light. Young's explanation of the colour of thin plates as by reflection arises from the fact that the instant light gives rise to two beams that reach the eye. One of the beams is reflected at the first surface of the plate, and the other at the second surface, and these two beams produce the colours by their interference. The first publication of Young's paper received a fierce attack from Henry Brougham, who later became the Lord Chancellor of England. So intense was his attack that Young failed to make any impression with his ideas in the ensuing years. Young ploughed on and investigated fringes of shadows and then would turn his attention to the behaviour of light in crystals, which had last been looked at by Huygens more than a century earlier. Meanwhile, the corpuscular theory was also making good progress and was likely to undermine Young's work. The first of these was a dynamical explanation of the refractions of light inside a crystal which was published in 1808 by Laplace. His method was an extension of the work of Maupertuis. His concept was that the crystalline medium acts on the particles of light in the light ray so as to modify their speed in a ratio that depended on the inclination to the axis of the crystal. Young promptly attacked the idea by pointing out the improbability of such a system of forces that will be required to impress the requisite change of velocity on the light particles. Meanwhile, in January 1808, Etienne-Louis Malus made a discovery while observing the sun setting through a crystal of Iceland spa reflecting from a window. He noticed that the two images were of very different intensities. He went on to discover that light which had been refracted at the surface of a transparent substance likewise possesses in some degree this same property to which he gave the name polarization. 
The wave theory at this time was struggling. Diffraction was not properly explained and polarization had no explanation. The upholders of the corpuscular theory were emboldened by this and proposed diffraction as the next topic for the Academy's prize of 1818. This would ultimately spell the end and the winning paper would signal a series of reversals that would see the corpuscular theory totally overthrown. The author of this paper was Augustin Fresnel. In 1816 he presented his paper where he outlined that diffraction effects were caused by the mutual interference of the secondary waves emitted by the portions of the original wavefront which had not been obstructed by the diffraction screen. Fresnel's method of calculation utilized the principles of both Huygens and Young. This original paper would, over the next two years, be developed into a memoir. It would need a champion, as Laplace, Poisson, and some other supporters of the corpuscular theory occupied the majority of the commission. Poisson, when reading this manuscript, noticed his analysis could be extended to include other cases. He suggested this to Fresnel, who would later confirm this experimentally and in so doing confirm this new theory. The concordance of observation and calculation was so admirable in all cases where a comparison was possible that the prize was awarded to Fresnel without further hesitation. In the same year Fresnel also published an investigation into the influence of Earth's motion on light. He viewed that the light ether pervaded the substance of all material bodies with little or no resistance. He viewed that the ether surrounding the Earth to be at rest and unaffected by the Earth's motion. This gave rise to a series of further questions. What if a slab of glass with a face is carried along by the motion of the Earth and its desire to adjust it so that a ray coming from a certain star will not be refracted when entering the glass? Should the surface be placed at right angles to the true direction of the star as freed from aberration? or to its apparent direction as affected by aberration. This question had initially been raised by Mitchell. Arago submitted the matter to the test and concluded that light coming from any star behaves in all cases of reflection and refraction precisely as if the star were situated in the place which it appeared to occupy due to aberration as if the earth were at rest so that the apparent refraction in a moving prism is equal to the absolute refraction in a fixed. Fresnel now set out to provide a theory capable of explaining Arago's results. To this end he adopted Young's suggestion that the refractive powers of transparent bodies depend on the concentration of ethers within them and made this proportional to the square of the refractive index. He also assumed that when a body is in motion the parts of the ether whose densities were above that in the vacuum would be carried along with it while the rest would be stationary. Fresnel then proceeded to solve the problems of refraction in the moving bodies. He showed that the apparent position of terrestrial objects carried along with the observer are not displaced by Earth's motion, that the experiments in refraction and interference are not influenced by any motion which is common to the source, the apparatus, and the observer and that light travels between given points of a moving material system by the path of least time. The greatest problem now confronting the investigators of light was to reconcile the facts of polarization with the principles of the wave theory. In 1816 Young received a visit from Argo who told him of new experimental results which showed that two beams of polarized light in planes at right angles to each other do not interfere with each other where ordinary light would. Young finally had the key to understanding the problem. The solution consisted of the alternative which Bernoulli had rejected 80 years before. The vibrations of light are executed at right angles to the direction of propagation. It must be remembered that the theory of propagation of waves in an elastic solid was as yet unknown and light was still always interpreted by the analogy with the vibrations of sound in air for which the direction of vibration is the same as that of propagation. Fresnel felt it important to explain this new departure. With wonderful insight he said, the geometers who have discussed the vibrations of the elastic fluid hitherto have taken account of no accelerating forces 
except those arising from the difference of condensation of dilation between consecutive layers. He pointed out that if we also suppose the medium possesses a rigidity or power of resisting distortion such as is manifest by all actual solid bodies, it will be capable of transverse vibration. The absence of longitudinal waves in the ether he accounted for by supposing that the forces which oppose condensation are far more powerful than those which oppose distortion, and that the velocity with which condensations are propagated is so great compared with the speed of oscillation of light that a practical equilibrium of pressure is maintained perpetually. Fresnel outlined the difference between the ordinary and polarised light as follows. Direct light can be considered as the union or more exactly as the rapid succession of a system of waves polarised in all directions. According to this way of looking at the matter, the act of polarisation consists not in creating transverse motions, but in decomposing them into two invariable directions and separating the components from each other. For then, in each of them, the oscillatory motions take place always in the same plane. By the genius of Young and Fresnel, the wave theory of light was established in a position so strong that from this point onwards, the corpuscular hypothesis was unable to attract any new talent to further it. In the next part, we will explore how this shaped the ideas that the ether had to be an elastic solid. As always, be brave, be curious, the truth is waiting for us. Until next time.